ASEAN leaders have pledged to work together and press on with their vision of an ASEAN community by 2015. The show of solidarity came at the end of their 20th summit in the Cambodian capital, Phnom Penh. The leaders also voiced support and offered words of encouragement for Myanmar, urging it to pursue democracy on the heels of the country's smooth by-elections. The ASEAN summit retreat was a time for leaders to hold frank discussions on regional and international issues. Singapore's Prime Minister Lee shared his thoughts on the economy. He said the global economy appears to have stabilised and the outlook is more positive. But he warned that some downside risks are still lurking, like fiscal deficits and tensions in the Middle East. Mr Lee stressed that ASEAN must work together and press on with its regional commitments like the ASEAN Community 2015 vision. You will not see a dramatic change overnight, but ASEAN has been one of the major factors why Southeast Asia has been stable, people have competed peacefully, and by and large we've been able to prosper. And the more we can work together, I think the more we can reinforce that basis at a time of a considerable global uh, uncertainty and challenge. In practical terms, we are trying to make it easier for people to trade, to invest, to work together with one another, and to have an interest in one another's success. The theme for the ASEAN Summit is One Community, One Destiny, and a key outcome of the two-day meeting is the non pen Declaration, which sets out the directions and highlights some of the work that's left to be done by the 10-member grouping to achieve its vision of 2015. Turning to Myanmar, Mr. Lee said Singapore welcomes the country's progress in its transition to democracy. He hopes that the country's stakeholders will push on with national reconciliation for the good of the people and to help Myanmar break out of isolation. I think we took the right approach in keeping Myanmar in the family and working with Myanmar rather than trying to ostracize it. I hope that this will um, help them to uh, considerably improve their links with the world, particularly the developed world, and I hope certainly that uh, the sanctions will be lifted because really the sanctions are not uh, helpful. Another concern discussed in the summit, North Korea. In their joint statement, ASEAN leaders called for restraint on the Korean Peninsula amid tensions stemming from North Korea's plan to launch a rocket later in April. As Ramesh Channel News Asia in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Also at the ASEAN summit, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Lung says one year after the general election, the government has changed its approach in many areas, particularly in the process of engaging the electorate and in policy outcomes. Mr Lee says this was a necessary and helpful change. As Singapore enters a new phase, this two-way process should result in both sides working together to make Singapore succeed. The 6th of May will be a year since Singapore had its last general election. After the polls, Mr. Lee had spoken of greater engagement with the people. And Mr. Lee says the process has been helpful. But it is something which must work in a two-way process. It's not just what the government does, it's also how the electorate sees their role in a new environment and how it sees that it can contribute and what its responsibilities are towards making the system work in a different way. Because this is not about what more the government will do. Of course, the government must do all that it can. It's its responsibility. But it's also about how we can work together in order to make Singapore succeed. And that calls on Singaporeans to speak out, but also to participate and to feel a responsibility to do their part in order to make things happen the right way. As for how Singaporeans have done on this count, Mr Lee thinks the process is still ongoing. I believe after one year, uh, there's a certain... Um, stability which is um, being restored in terms of the mood and the expectations but it will take some time more and um, the, the balance between speaking out and uh, working together is something which has to be which, which still needs to be worked upon. He cited the example of the feedback on building studio apartments at Toyi for the elderly as one where speaking out and working together fell short. People respond more uh, articulately now, they organize together more easily. The internet has enabled this to happen much more readily than before and also people are much more uh, educated and vocal. And so we have to manage this. But if we, we must not go to a position where uh, NIMBY, not in my backyard, 
becomes a general attitude among Singaporeans because then we will stymie ourselves. If we take a self-centered approach to, to, to problems, uh, we will not be able to do the best for ourselves as a community. And we must make sure that we don't end up with a lot of things No. We have to consult, we have to adjust. If you look at Bukit Brown, you have to talk and explain. But if at the end we cannot move at all, then you would not have, you will not only not have tomorrow's Singapore, we wouldn't even have today's Singapore. Prime Minister Lee adds that Singaporeans must feel together ethnically so that race, language or religion do not become sensitive issues. This especially in the age of the internet, when it is easy to get people upset about such subjects. He also addressed the furor over blog post by NUS scholar Sun Tzu, who's from China. He shouldn't have made the blog post he did. He's been chastised. He's been disciplined. He has expressed his contrition, that he's sorry about it. And I think we should accept that. And we should, we should be able to move on from that and deal with that as one person who misspoke. And we should not, because of one incident, make that into an issue that all immigrants are like that or all Singaporeans should feel like that towards uh, not even immigrants but towards non-Singaporeans who are in Singapore either studying here or working here. As for the possibility of a by-election in Kang, Mr Lee did not want to be drawn into any speculation over whether it will be expanded to include more constituencies. Deputy Prime Minister Taman Shanmugaratnam says Singapore's social policies should not come at the expense of future generations. Mr Taman said that while social policies such as health and pension provisions are very attractive, the financial crisis in Europe has shown how unsustainable a welfare system is. Make sure that when we talk about a fair and inclusive society, a fair and inclusive society, it's not just for five years or two or three electoral terms which is what most governments do, in fact, typically just for one electoral term. But it's about a fair and inclusive society for our children's generation and for their children. That, too, has to be what is special about our society, that we think hard about our children and want to make sure that whatever we do, we don't increase the burden on future generations. Mr. Taman was speaking at a ministerial forum organized by the National University of Singapore. Keeping to the theme of social inclusiveness, Mr. Taman said the government is focused on making a significant leap in living standards for Singaporeans and also ensuring fair distribution. He said more must be done to keep social mobility going. This means ensuring that those who start off with disadvantages have a way of moving up and not be stuck at the same level over generations. In world news, Australia has hailed a new chapter in its 60-year alliance with the United States as the first of some 2,500 U.S. troops arrive in the city of Darwin. It's part of plans to deepen a U.S. military presence in the Asia-Pacific. This is the fastest growing economic area and also the one that is enduring the uh, greatest demographic change. And we want to make sure that it continues to be a peaceful, prosperous and stable area. The way that we accomplish that is by ensuring that uh, trade routes are open and that we're prepared for any issue that could come up. These 200 Marines will be deployed for six months. Darwin's location, some 800 kilometers away from Indonesia, puts the Marines in a position to respond quickly to developments in Southeast Asia and in the South China Sea. Chinese officials see the move as part of Washington's strategy to contain it, though the U.S. has denied this. Australia's defense minister has also sought to reassure neighbors, suggesting that Indonesia and even China could be included in future joint exercises. A Typhoon 4 storm is now battering northern Japan after leaving a trail of damage in the western parts of the country. It left four people dead and more than 400 injured. The prefectures of Miyagi, Yamagata, Niigata and Hokkaido were among those hit by violent winds today. The storm disrupted power supplies and transport systems with hundreds of flights grounded and train services cancelled. Public transportation was disrupted with over 70 flights cancelled and northern bound bullet trains temporarily suspended. Forecasters say the severe low pressure system is expected to pass over Japan by the end of today. 
Now, Indonesia's weather agency has warned Jakarta residents of the possibility of further flooding in the coming days. More rain is forecast over the next three days. Jakarta's governor has raised the alert level and prepared for possible evacuations. Thousands across the capital have already been affected by flooding triggered by Monday night's heavy rain. The waters were up to two meters deep in some parts of the city. The floods also caused severe traffic congestion. Up to a dozen tornadoes have torn through the U.S. state of Texas in a densely populated Dallas-Fort Worth area. Homes were destroyed, vehicles flipped over and planes damaged by hail. Residents scrambled to safety as the tornadoes bore down during the early afternoon when schools and workplaces were open. More than a dozen injuries were reported and the Dallas mayor says it's a miracle no one was killed. April is the peak of the U.S. tornado season. Coming up on News 5, the National Youth Council's game plan to groom our future leaders. And COE prices up again in all categories except for one. I like the old The National Youth Council will be taking more concrete steps to groom the next generation of Singapore's leaders. For the first time, it's targeting working professionals as community of leaders who can advocate youth interests on national and community issues. The new chairman of the National Youth Council, Chan Chun Singh, wants to make youth activism more vibrant. At a roundtable discussion with the media, he outlined plans to achieve this. One key initiative is to create more opportunities for youths from different professions to come together. We're going to start off uh, new platforms to allow the youth leaders more opportunities to share their perspective and find solutions for the challenges, not just for their organisations but also for the country at large. So that in time to come, we hope to groom a new generation of leaders for Singapore that are deep in their own professional domains and also have the breadth of a perspective across different domains. The initiative aims to attract those aged between 28 and 35 years. They'll be nominated by organisations from a range of sectors, such as government, dance or manufacturing. Well, it's understood that the National Youth Council will be working with the Singapore National Employers Federation to ensure that there's representation of working professionals, especially from the private sector. There are also plans to refresh the tenant mix at SCAPE and bring in new youth organisations to develop the youth sector. The elderly population in Cheng San Salita Division will soon find that they can move around their neighbourhood more easily. They can also expect improved health care, all thanks to new intervention programmes by the grassroots organisations from the division. Initially, we thought that they needed a lot of assistance and help. What we realised is um, what they had wanted was to have an environment whereby they can move about and do their daily life with minimal fuss. One of the programs provides needy families with trolley bags so that it's easier for them to bring home donated food items. 1,000 families are expected to benefit from the program. Another initiative is wheelchair access for those who have an interest in gardening. To provide affordable health care, a free medical clinic will also be ready at the end of this year at Ang Mo Kyo Block 425. Run by Tong Chai Medical Institution, the clinic will provide free traditional Chinese medicine consultations. About 30% of the 50,000 residents of the predominantly HDB estate are above the age of 50. The Tanjung Paga and Bukit Tima railway stations will be opened to individuals and organisations for ad hoc activities and events. The Singapore Land Authority says both buildings are a part of Singapore's heritage. It hopes such activities and events will inject vibrancy and life to the buildings and the surrounding area. The buildings are on land formerly occupied by the Keretapi Tana Melayu or KTM and which has since been returned to the state. The first event at the Tanjung Paga railway station will be a fashion show on the 25th of April. Other events planned include exhibitions and art performances. Certificate of Entitlement or COE premiums were mostly higher in the latest bidding exercise. The biggest increase was in the open category, which is mainly for big cars. It rose by 5.6%, closing around $85,000. Premiums for big cars hit a new high about 84000 They are higher by 2.1%. 
Premiums for commercial vehicles rose by about 4.8% to close at about 54,900. COE prices for the small car category also rose by about 3.5%, closing at around 58,500. The only drop was for motorcycles, which fell by 5.2% at 1,896. In South Korea, it's not the prices of cars that's the worry for drivers, but rocketing gasoline prices. Prices there are setting new record highs almost on a daily basis. It's driven many Koreans to look for alternatives to owning a car. Car sharing is a new trend that has hit parts of South Korea. Reservations are made online, setting the place and time where you want to pick up and leave the car. For about 17,000 Korean won, about 15 U.S. dollars, you can use the car for three hours filled with gas to take you around 24 kilometers. One car sharing company that set up its business six months ago already has about 40,000 customers. When we think of renting cars, it's usually for a short period. But these days, instead of buying a new car, many Koreans are turning to long-term rental. Kim jong son pays about 450 U.S. dollars a month to drive his car. He drives around 100 kilometers every day. And he decided to sell his car because of soaring gasoline prices. And now he rents a vehicle which runs on liquefied petroleum gas. 연료비는 제가 한 달에 출퇴근하고 업무 보고 하는 것들이 한, 한 달에 한 70만 원 정도 들었었는데요. 거기서 한 25% 정도 정도는 매월 절감되는 것 같습니다. Kim Young Song, who runs his own business, has rented a car for one year. By renting, he can drive a new car every year. 기분 전환도 되고, 왜냐면 이제 목돈 들여서 새차 타면 못 해도 한 2, 3년은 타야 되는데, 또 그때 되면 또 이제 요즘 너무 빠르게 디자인이 변화되고, Renting means drivers don't need to worry about other costs like insurance, taxes and tune-ups. LPG prices are also cheaper than gasoline. Latest figures show that a total of 290,000 cars were rented out in 2011 compared to 110,000 in 2005. And the figures are expected to grow as Koreans look for alternatives to buying cars. Lim Yang So Cheong is Asia, Seoul. In Peru, some 600 dolphins have washed up dead on a stretch of coastline over the past few weeks. Biologists believe that acoustic disturbances during seabed exploration by oil companies could be the cause of the mass deaths. And as many as 3,000 dead dolphins have been found this year. After studying the corpses of the mammals, scientists found they didn't bear marks of external damage caused by fishing or poisoning. Instead, researchers found that the dolphins' middle ear bones have burst. The damage is said to come from sonic bursts made by oil companies as they explore the seabed. Still to come on 5, get bowled over by a big bid for a piece of ceramic. And why this beautiful bloom has become a headache for Chinese students. Welcome back. In business news, total property investment sales hit $4 billion in the first quarter of this year, down by about 50% from the previous three months. That's according to real estate consultancy CBRE. It attributes the drop to the weak global capital market sentiment and new property cooling measures introduced last December. Now, shares of DBS continue to slide today, down by another 2%. Investors appear unconvinced that a planned acquisition of Indonesia's bank Danamon will deliver increased value for the lender. And there are concerns that politics in Indonesia may yet scupper the deal. Overall, the STI fell by 1% today. And here are the market numbers. In football, Barcelona have reached their fifth successive Champions League semi-final after a 3-1 win over AC Milan in the second leg of their quarter-final tie. Barca go through 3-1 on aggregate after a goalless draw in the first leg. Barca will meet the winners of the tie between Chelsea and Benfica. 
Bayern Munich have also booked their spot in the semi-finals after seeing off Marseille in the second leg of their quarter-final tie. Bayern go through 4-0 on the aggregate. They look certain to meet Real Madrid in the semi-finals. And that's because Real hold a 3-0 advantage going into the second leg of their quarter-final against Apoel Nicosia later today. But Blues coach Jose Mourinho says his players must not be complacent. Hay que respetar a afición que, que, que quiere un, un buen partido y poquísimos cambios. Vamos a jugar con un equipo muy fuerte. Chelsea also start as favourites in their second leg tie against Benfica. The Blues have a precious 1-0 away goal lead from the first leg in Lisbon. Chelsea's manager insists that today's tie at Stamford Bridge is far from over. A one in lead is basically nothing, and uh, our players are aware uh, of of this, and uh, we, we'll have to go into this game with the right attitude. Next, an imperial Chinese bowl has fetched an eye-popping sum at an auction in Hong Kong. It may look plain, but this extremely rare porcelain bowl saw eight bidders competing for it for over 15 minutes. It was sold to an unidentified phone bidder for nearly 27 million US dollars. That's a new world record for a piece of ceramic from the Northern Song Dynasty. The Ruya Wash is around 900 years old and is the only bowl that features an organic floral shape and an opaque glaze. Ru ceramics are the rarest in China. They are named after one of five large kilns operating at the time. You might be forgiven for thinking this is Japan, but it's actually China's Wuhan University. More than 160,000 tourists are flooding the area every day during cherry blossom season. It's been a popular tourist attraction since the university opened up its grounds 10 years ago. But the large numbers of people have left trouble in their wake. Students complain of the piles of garbage and noise pollution. Some tourists have even busted into classrooms to take pictures. And that's News 5 tonight. Good night.